there were absolutely concerns in the market about a bubble, a pullback in AI spending. It seems that for, for the time being, at least going into 2024 and into 2025, spending on AI chips will be sustained. There's an old saying that during a gold rush, the people who strike it rich are the ones selling shovels. In today's context, if artificial intelligence is the new gold, then the chips or GPUs that power AI are the metaphorical shovels. New Street Research sees room for close to 10 times growth in AI chips over the next four years. Rolf Balk is the equities analyst behind this research. Rolf, thank you very much for joining us. This is a very bold claim. What makes you believe in this? Yes, thanks for having me, Pamela. Now, originally, this um, this 400 billion figure was pitched by the CEO of, of AMD um, as, a, as a target addressable market for AI chips. So um, what we did was to try to make sense of this number. Is it realistic? What, what does a world with, um, with 400 billion of AI chips looks like? Now, as a first step, what we did was we looked at um, the market for AI chips today. First, you have NVIDIA, which is 38 to 39 billion of spending. So the vast majority of that 45 billion market. Comes from one player. Absolutely. Um, and then you have Broadcom, which designs the, the TPU for Google. That's a specialized chip for AI workloads. That's another 2 billion or so. And then you have a few billion of CPUs, so more standardized chips. And that gets you to that 45 billion market. Now, as a next step, we looked at how those different segments could grow between 2023 and 2027. So what we took as, a, as an assumption there was that AI accelerators, so the chip of Google and alike, would grow at a much faster pace than the rest of the market, because this is really a priority for those companies. Now, even if you assume that market to grow at, uh, at more than 100% over, um, over the coming years, that still leaves a massive chunk for the GPU market, so the market of, of NVIDIA and alike. So bottom line for 2027, we expect that market to grow materially and for GPUs to capture the vast majority of that growth, despite AI accelerators increasing materially in the mix. So at the end of 2023, there were 20 million AI chips installed, but you do expect that to be in the order of 100 million AI chips by the end of 2027. Um, can you put that context into what this all means? Yeah, absolutely. So 100 million chips equates to around 10 million um, AI servers. Now, um, today, what powers the, the internet, um, as we know it, is around 75 million chips. So what we essentially say here is that AI could grow into a 10 million server market, and that compares to around 75 million of, um, of, of servers being used today to power the internet. Now, when you think about usage, what it would equate to is around 10% of, um, of internet users using AI for um, roughly the same amount as they use the internet for for today or a much smaller segment of the market using AI for around 15 minutes per day or so, which we think is a very realistic um, assumption to make. It is not, um, it's not outlandish in the context that today the average usage of, of an internet server is around 20 minutes per user or so. For the ones that are using AI applications. Absolutely. I would assume it would go beyond 15 minutes with companies trying to adapt AI into their workflows and... <laughs> yeah, definitely. There, there is upside to this number, absolutely. Um, the, the, I think the challenge here today as we, as we think about this, this forecast is that it is, um, it's difficult to envision at the moment how AI is going to be used in our everyday lives. What we'll see going forward is that AI will be integrated into your office applications more as a background service that you use more continuously rather than that you have to have to go to the application and use it on a in a um, in a conscious manner mm -hmm. and that will of course massively increase usage thank you Rolf. now let's check in with our resident economist alex holmes from oxford economics alex there's a geopolitical risk here with ai chips and taiwan is at the center 
Thanks, Pamela. You're right. The next geopolitical flashpoint is probably Taiwan. And if oil was at the core of geopolitical clashes at the end of the last century, chips are front and center this century. So Taiwan is the world's largest manufacturing hub for chips. It's also home to the world's largest chip maker, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. They make 90% of the world's advanced chips, including those designed by Nvidia. You can see by comparison, the United States only has a small part of this market. And most likely it's why President Biden introduced the CHIPS Act in 2022. The CHIPS Act is designed to bring back domestic semiconductor manufacturing from Asia by offering a menu of subsidies, tax credits, domestic content rules that promote onshore research, development and manufacturing. This chart perhaps best shows what the US is trying to achieve with the CHIPS Act. Number one is that the US is trying to drive foundry investment in the US, but there is a trade-off. And if you look at point three, this move by the US weakens Taiwan's security. And there's another trade-off. If you look at point six, it also has the potential to actually increase the price of chips globally to create inflation. So if you did really want evidence that data is in fact the new oil, just look at the broader geopolitical context of the chip sector right now. Thank you very much for that, Alex. Rolf, you've spent your whole career um, analyzing and looking at t tech companies from Europe, London, and now here in Asia. Um, now it's pretty hard to separate the uh, tech companies from the chips powering the tech. Um, what's your advice to anyone investing in this space right now? It is very difficult as an investor or as an analyst to think about the company without considering their, their strategy in semiconductors. So back in 2018, the market investors were, were overly concerned about Tesla's ability to, to manufacture a mass market vehicle, the, what we now know as a Model 3. There were concerns around bankruptcy, um, around um, ramping up production. What we saw at the time from looking at a small semiconductor company, Infineon, uh, it's a German semiconductor company, is that Tesla was buying these, these chips called power semiconductors and integrating them in a way in their vehicle that, that no one else was able to do at that point in time. Um, and that to us really spoke to Tesla's ability to vertically integrate their processes, their manufacturing, and, um, and to us that translated into a tangible advantage versus, versus incumbents in that space. So, um, that is but a very small example of a company that um, that through um, something that might not be on everyone's radar when they look at a company like Tesla um, that, uh, that was able to differentiate in a way that others were not able to do. And you have a philosophy of covering technology companies. Um, rather than specializing in just one vertical, you look at companies across the entire value chain. Some of the companies you mentioned, Tesla, Google, of course, uh, NVIDIA and TSMC, um, and even Grab. Uh, can you explain to us why you think that's the best model to approach investing and how has that helped you make uh, investment recommendations? It is very difficult I believe to to look at a company such as um, such as Apple, without looking at TSMC, who who are responsible for all of the manufacturing of their chips, and simultaneously, it's very difficult to look at TSMC without considering the companies that supply TSMC with uh, the equipment that they need to manufacture those chips. The shovels. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, you mentioned NVIDIA being one of the largest in the space, um, now being one of the 10 biggest companies in the world. Um, the market cap is about one and a half trillion US dollars. Is NVIDIA just getting started or is it close to running out of steam? Last year, of course, NVIDIA, the stock has had a great run. But um, towards the middle of the year, there were absolutely concerns in the market about about um, a, a bubble, um, a, a pullback in in um, in AI spending. Um, that concern, I think, has abated to to some degree. It seems that for for the time being, at least going into 2024 and into 2025, spending on AI um, on AI chips will be sustained. And NVIDIA um, has also done a phenomenal job in, in managing their competitive position. They remain very competitive despite, um, despite several peers releasing 
competitive products. We think that there's a lot more room there for, for appreciation of the stock and growth in the company. Who would you say is the closest challenger to NVIDIA and um, do they pose a threat? Yes, um, there's, there's really two types of challenges for NVIDIA. One are, are companies such as Amazon, Google, um, Facebook, Microsoft developing their own in-house chips. Um, that is something that, um, that only Google has been successful at so far. The obvious reason for that is that today an NVIDIA chip um, costs around four to five times as much as you would pay if you were to design that chip yourself. And all of that is essentially profit for NVIDIA. NVIDIA CEO has been very vocal on the potential of generative AI for, for, for a long period of time. But the moment it materialized, um, it still took the market by surprise. And, um, and that's what we've seen in the stock performance of, of the company over the last year. Now, secondly, there is AMD. So AMD is the other company that has high-end GPUs in the market. They've, um, they've released their comp competing products last year. Um, the way to think about this is that AMD is really the challenger in this, um, in this market. But there is a risk that should be taken into account there. And that risk mostly centers around, um, around NVIDIA's ecosystem. Uh, that's a bit of a buzzword, ecosystem. But for NVIDIA particularly, what it means is they have a very large number of, of engineers that are familiar with NVIDIA architecture. Now, um, we, we know from AMD that they are, um, they are a formidable company as well. They, they have gained um, a tremendous market share in the CPU market versus Intel over the last few years. So um, it doesn't mean that AMD and can't replicate this in GPUs, they absolutely could. But it is an uphill battle because NVIDIA is moving very fast and executing very well. And AMD does not have such a mature ecosystem as of yet. What you had described earlier about this almost hockey stick of a growth trajectory for artificial intelligence, are we um, at all um, coming up, do you see uh, against an AI bubble or an AI revolution? It's a great question, and we we can't completely rule out that we'll we'll enter somewhat of a bubble at some point in time. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, I think for 2024 and 2025, the demand seems to be seems to be sustainable, but there is absolutely risk of a pullback um, at some point beyond. Now, when we started the conversation, we talked a bit about, about the implied usage of AI and the number of minutes that people would have to spend on AI applications. And I think that leaves a lot of room for upside. So fundamentally, even though there is a risk of such a correction, um, fundamentally, I do think that growth um, can be sustained over the longer term. All right. Well, um, with that, any parting wisdoms on this topic? Any uh, takeaways uh, our audience should have? We we have AI, but what do we what we did not talk about today is renewable energy, electric vehicles, um, the broader digitalization, AI on your smartphone. So there's a number of applications and use cases that are going to drive semiconductor demand over the coming years. And, um, and the semiconductor sector as a whole is going to be a beneficiary of those trends. All right, thank you very much for your wisdom and insights. A big thank you to our special guest, Rolf Bulk, New Street Research Equities Analyst, and our resident expert, Alex Holmes from Oxford Economics. Thank you both. And thanks for tuning in to episode two of I See Your Trade, season four. I See Your Trade is brought to you by IC Markets, a leading high performance trading provider. Trade up to IC Markets. Thanks for joining us today. And remember, you can watch and listen back the episodes from the past three seasons on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as YouTube. See you next time.